Good morning and welcome to another episode of Better Business, Better Life. I've always been a buyer. When I worked for distribution companies, I was the buyer. So I, I love making money when you buy and I believe that you make, you make more money when you buy um, rather than selling. <laughs> You know, we've made the mistakes of, you know, uh, recruiting people uh, or using advisors that were cheap, that gave us the cheapest quote. And, you know, we soon found out that, you know, that didn't work um, and all that stuff. So over the years and where we transact internationally now, our business, our business advisors and external advisors and our own team has to keep evolving. <laughs> I am joined today by Graham and Leanne Carling, who are based over in Dubai. But as you will hear from their accents, they're originally not from Dubai. I'll, I'll leave you to guess where they're from. Now, they're a husband and wife couple who have decided that they not only want to be married, but want to be in business together. So today I'm looking forward to finding out a little bit more about how that came to be and how it's working for them. Welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you for having us. Oh, absolute pleasure. Thank you. So you're not originally from Dubai. That's pretty obvious from your accent. So why don't you tell us a wee bit about how you got to where you are now and what you're up to? Yeah, well, um, yeah, you're, you're right. We're not originally from Dubai. We've been here uh, for around three years now. Originally from Scotland in the UK. Um, and uh, I'm actually from the east coast of Scotland, in uh, a city called Dundee, and Leanne is from the... The big smoke, if you like, in Scotland and the West Coast and, and Glasgow. And Glasgow. Glasgow. Lovely. Yep. yep. And you started off um, in business by just having one property and you've now grown it, mm. a local property at that, and now you've grown it to be a sort of a global organisation, obviously living in Dubai with a family as well. But what is your background? Mm. How did you even get into business and why business together? Well, I think um, if we take this back, uh, if I go, if I go right back, um, you know, when I when I was at school, I didn't really know. I wasn't very academic. I wasn't uh, particularly clever. Um, I, I really didn't. From where I came from, a working class city, um, uh, you know, you kind of there was just a path that you followed, uh, which was you went to school, and then you went and got a trade, you know, and went and worked in the building industry, in the construction industry. And there's no real rhyme or reason about it. It was just kind of what you'd done. So when I was younger, yeah, I had no idea when I was leaving school what I wanted to be. All my friends were uh, leaving and to become a joiner or, or a brickie or a plumber or, 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 or an electrician. And I just blindly um, went with a, um, went along with that. You know, so I, I, you know, again, I just sort of followed the masses um, my family and friends, that was the path that they took. It wasn't like we, you know, we didn't have any money. There wasn't a, a route into, um, I suppose, you know, university education or anything. You just left school and you went and got a trade. So I went and became a, an apprentice a joiner. I, there was a scheme at the time uh, back in uh, 1990, which was uh, 89, 90 in the UK, a youth training scheme. So you were on the you, 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 you left school, you went on this before you became an apprentice and you were on the grand sum of £29.50 per week that the, that the government paid for. So um, so anyway, that, that, that was kind of, I was, you know, I didn't know what I wanted to do when I left school. And I must admit, you know, I chose the wrong thing because um, I was hopeless at joining. You know, I was bad. I'm still is. I'm still, yeah, I can't do anything, you know, like that. But I, when I left school, got got that job. It was in a, a re, a, a, one of the largest companies in my city. And I was quite fortunate to get the job. I managed to scrape by and pass the test. But really, from day one, hated it. You know, I just, I just hated it. Um, and I think for me, I've always had this itching within me that I wanted to run my own businesses and mind my own business. Um, I've I, I seen the struggles of my parents financially and, and my dad done particularly well given where he came from, the housing scheme, rough area, 
you know, a lot of deprivation, a large family, had no money, and he kind of done well for himself in the corporate world. But still, we never had any money. You know, I didn't, it wasn't that we were unhappy, but we had no money. And any sort of arguments or disagreements in my family was generally around money. So no matter how well my dad done in the corporate world or how much money he made or, you know, a, a, a wage increase or a bonus, he, we still never had any money. You know, and every Christmas was a problem. He never had any money to, it would be a fight between my mum and dad. We didn't have enough money for Christmas. My dad would be chasing his Christmas bonus and all of this. So, so kind of the corporate world didn't make any sense to me because even if you were successful at it, and as he got older, he was under more and more pressure to keep the job. So from a position of being, I suppose, the young whippersnapper coming through, at some point you become the old guy. And and then you're, and I've, I'd seen it with other members of my family and people that I just knew. They were then clinging on, you know, to retirement to try and make it, to, to, to just survive to them. So it never really made any sense to me. So I just always had this within me that I didn't want to be the same as my dad. I wanted to be, if I was going to, you know, not have that stressful life around money, I, knew I really needed to mind my own business. So um, that's the long story, Deborah. you know, but it it's, uh, gives you uh, the context and the background. It's a good, it's a good motivator, you. isn't it? It's a good motivator when you're going yeah. to want to do better than what your your family has done. So you got yeah. into business, um, and of course it was an overnight yeah. success, and everything was fabulous, right? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. Listen, I started my first business, and I think it was around about 1999. And by the time I had, oh, 2002, I had three failed businesses. <laughs> so there were small businesses. I started them myself. I really didn't have a clue what I was doing. I, I had no real mentor, no real guidance. My dad was the, the person that, sh that showed me ambition, but he didn't have the experience or the knowledge or the, uh, or the wherewithal of running his own business. He was always good in a corporate environment. So, um, you know, I, I, I ventured onto that path myself and really didn't have a clue about money and debt and finance and tax and leverage and, and all of that stuff. And so, you know, with, by, by the time 2002 came, um, I had three failed business, small businesses, uh, new startups that I'd done myself with my, my brother and, and, and various things. And um, for one reason or another, they didn't work out. And um, come 2002, I was, I was skint, had no money, uh, ego dented, um, licked my wounds, really, and uh, had to go back, um, unfortunately, to mainstream employment. You know, I had to go and get a, a job. I just over broke again. And um, it took me a few years mm. to recover from that, I have to say. Mm. Okay, as, as you expect. Yeah, but I think sometimes there are lessons that we learn from those disasters that uh, yeah. it's, the, it's the best way to learn them. You don't forget those lessons easily, do you? No, yeah, I've had, no. I've had a couple of foul oh, businesses yeah. myself, so I know exactly what it feels like. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you don't, and um, they're the best lessons. And what one of the change, the changing point for me was I just started back working again, you know, in mainstream, and um, I caught the tail end of an Oprah Winfrey show, and it was a guy called Robert Kiyosaki oh, yes. who was discussing his book, Rich Dad Poor Dad. So I, I bought the book, yeah. It was like a light bulb moment for me, as simple as that book is, and it's a timeless, timeless book. And um, it just, it just, you know, it was like a light switch going on where I had no clue. I had never been in any environment about, you know, the about money and how to manage money and debt and mm -hmm. uh, leverage you know, and what the rich do compared to the poor. Mm -hmm. uh, I'd always been taking the poor, poor person's advice. And I needed to make sure that um, I took the rich person or the rich dad's, the rich dad's advice. So um, I, I just, it was a real wake up call for me that I genuinely had no idea. It was not something I came across in my schooling, in my family or anything. 
I had to go and educate and, uh, and become financially educated. Mm. And between 2002 and 2007, and Leanne will tell you, uh, we, we met during that period working for this uh, a mainstream employer. So, uh, you know, that was, that was the plus point of, of, of going back to working again. And um, so, you know, between then, I, we, we, I just educated myself as much as I could to be in a position that when the time was right, my confidence was right and recovered financially, that I would go back again mm. and uh, go back, you know, and give it another shot and, and, and what, you know, working for myself. Yeah, we have a similar story. I mean, I also um, had to go back into corporate world to lick my wounds after losing quite a bit of money in my first failed business. And I, I stuck it for three and a half years and I, had, I used that time to educate myself, get myself back in the position. And as you said, rebuild your confidence because even though yeah. you know that it's not necessarily your fault that this happened, there's still an element of, well, you know, I, I should have known better, I could have done better, et cetera, et cetera. You, you beat yourself up, don't you? Mm -hmm. yeah. So, Leanne, I'm, yeah, I'm really keen I'm... to hear your side of the story. So, you met whilst you were back in this this corporate job together. What's your background? Yeah, Graham and I have both pretty similar backgrounds from obviously east and west coast of Scotland. Um, I also left school with no higher education, um, not knowing what I wanted to do. I, I fancied the fire brigade but went to an open day and was put off, um, told to go and get some life skills before I, I, I considered joining. Um, and my mother and father were similar to Graham, both worked in jobs for 27 years, 33 years with the one company, um, a job for life. Um, and I followed in my father's footsteps into the, the, the corporate world of distribution. And I actually loved it. I really, really loved it. I enjoyed it. I enjoyed the hustle and bustle, the solving problems. Um, I really enjoyed it, but there was something missing. And I was forever seeking new employment, getting you know promotion within different companies. And I can remember my dad saying, Leanne, you're going to be unemployable soon. You know, no, you keep moving jobs. What's wrong? But I, I didn't know what it was, and I was looking for something else. And then, as Graham says, we met in 2005, 2004, 2005, through employment, and we started dating, and the first gift that Graham bought me was Rich Woman by Kim Kiyosaki, and then I read Rich Dad, Poor Dad, so we then started our journey, because I was like, uh -huh, this is a light bulb, this is what I've been looking for, um, and that's where our journey started, uh, working together. Okay, cool. And so how did you decide what that business was going to be and what you wanted to do? <coughs> Graham had been studying the, the property market for a couple of years before we met, and he had really educated himself um, on the sector, and then we started learning together. Um, but as Graham says, it was about two or three years before we bought our first property after meeting you know and educating ourselves and studying the market and taking the leap if you if you if you um i mean if you've read rich dad poor dad yep. you know you'll know it's very sort of real estate focused mm -hmm. so it kind of took you down that that angle but really so that's you know that was an industry that I, I was really interested in having read that book but during that period between 2002 and you know, three to 2007, the numbers didn't make any sense. If I was following the principles of uh, you know, cash flow, financial freedom, and all that stuff, the numbers didn't make any sense. But we were sitting in the wings waiting on the right opportunity, mm. on the right moment, the right time. And at the financial crash of 2007 and 8, when everybody was getting out of the property business, we were getting in because... For the first time, in a, a, you know, in, in, a, in a number of years, certainly since I'd become interested, the numbers started to make sense. Mm -hmm. You could buy properties at a discount. You were able to generate monthly cash flow and pick up, uh, pick up, you know, some real bargains in the market. So that's um, that's really how how we quit our jobs on the same day, October the end of October two thousand and seven. But we'd been sitting waiting in the wings. For the timing in the market to be right to get into that sector 
Mm, okay. And so that was the first property, and obviously from then you followed the principles of Rich Dad, Poor Dad. But in terms of actually, because it's still a business, right? You still actually have to run a business that manage, like, purchases, manages all these properties. Um, how did you decide who was going to do what in the business? I think, I think we just kind of fell into the roles, but Graham does, you know, he has a, a, a right financial kind of legal mindset, you know, he interests them all the different products on the market, etc. Um, I love, I've always been a buyer. When I worked for distribution companies, I was the buyer. So I, I love making money when you buy. And I believe that you make, you make more money when you buy um, rather than selling. So, so that was my background and my mindset. So I love anal analyzing deals, you know, trying to negotiate and then Graham goes away and gets the, the finance the legals. Um, or, you know, however we're going to fund and then the legal side of it. And then it just naturally came back to me for the, the property management side of things. And I think that was one of the, the we were like, oh, you know, you're buying all these properties, you forget you've got to manage them at the other side, you know, and then until you get to a certain level and, and mm. can hand them across to a company or, you know, you're not doing them yourself, it, it, it's, it's a tough game. Sure. And so, do you have a team that helps you with some of this stuff now? Yes, no, we do. Yeah. yeah. I mean, when we start, you know, we were everything. Yes. We were, we were everything, you know. In terms of the marketing, Leanne would be walking around the streets, but leaflets through people's door with our, our newly born <laughs> baby, you know, our son yeah. in, in his pram and, and all that, then come home, you know, all of that. So, you, you'll know yourself running businesses. You're everything at the start. Yeah. And, you, you know, and you have to do everything in it's you know, and it's a, it's it's hard work, and um, and it's still hard work. But I think um, for us now, our, our team continues to evolve as we grow. Um, you know, we've made the mistakes of, you know, uh, recruiting people uh, or using advisors that were cheap that gave us the cheapest quote, and you know, we soon found out that you know that didn't work, um, and all that stuff. So over the years, and where we transact internationally now. Our business, our business advisors and external advisors and our own team has to keep evolving mm. because as we evolve, it's, you, you can have really important members of your team that um, are part of your journey at that point, but they can't go any further. Yeah. You know, they're, they're limited and, and, and you've got to deal with that yep. because, you know, you can be loyal to the person and likewise, that's tricky especially if you like them and, and they've been loyal to you. But if they're limited, yeah. it restricts it for the, for, the, for the company, for the business, for the whole. And those decisions are, are tough. But the one thing we've learned over the years is it, you just keep evolving mm. and you have to keep on growing, yeah. you know, and growing your team and, and, and all that. Mm. Yeah. And I think I mean, it's been proven through books like Scaling Up and EOS. It's like, you know, as the, the the team that gets to 1 million won't get you to 10 million. The team that gets you to 10 million won't get you to 100 million or 50 million. So you've got to actually look at, you know, what does the business need now for the next 12 months? And how do we define yeah. what that business needs for the next 12 months? And then do the people we have now, do they actually, we say GWC, but they actually, if they get it, they want it. They have capacity to do it. And as the business grows, yeah. sometimes they don't have the capacity. And it's not that they're not good people. It's not that they don't share your core yes. value values but they're just not they don't have the experience the technical knowledge the expertise whatever it is to get you to the next level yeah. hopefully you can find them another role but not always <laughs> no and, and i think one of the one of the things we've learned is we have tried to uh, you know again uh, through experience we've tried to put square peg around holes though it doesn't work yeah. you know so cut cut quick yeah. deal with it quickly because a small problem left festers it just becomes a big problem, and and I say problem. I don't mean it in a in the in, in the sense that the people are the problems. It's just their skill set, particularly if you're growing at a you know very fast rate. You need people that can be on that same journey with you that that understand that and are capable of operating at the speed that you're operating at the business is, is growing at. Yeah. And and I think it's I, I think it's unfair on both sides too, right? If you've got somebody who's not actually capable of doing that, then they're also gonna be pretty miserable anyway. So you're better off to actually let them yeah. go than keep them there and, and not have it certainly be else. Yeah. Sorry Leanne, you were gonna say? Yeah. 
it's going to say at the level you want your business to be at. If they're if they're not at that level, they're holding your business back. Yeah. You know, so you do need to cut cut quick and and move on. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think for us, you know, we over the years, some of the things that have been our downside uh, for us that we've learned is we are very loyal people, but we've been loyal to the to the person as opposed to the outcome. Mm. Or, or as opposed to their what they're delivering, and we've changed that over the last sort of couple of years. You know, we very much they need, we need to be results driven, and make sure that we continue that, that the people can and we continue to deliver. It's our responsibility to look after the whole. You know, at all times, and that's difficult for others to see at times because they only see their their piece mm-hmm. of it. Where our views is, you know, global, we've got to have a look at and make sure that we protect every part of our businesses at all times and we have the right people in the right places that can deliver it. And like you say, you know, can deliver it not last year, but next year and the following year. Yeah. 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 So tell me, I mean, how do you go about picking staff? Like, how do you decide who's a right fit for the organisation? Or consultants for that matter, or anybody you work with? Well, it, it, I mean, it, it's tricky. I mean, you're dealing with people. Um, we look for we look for experience. I think for us, it, it, when we started out, there was nothing happier than we have a lot of our team that have been with us from the start, and they've been on the same journey. That's so fulfilling. But there's been a lot of people dropped off. Also, you know, we want people to be on this journey. This this um, uh, you know. To, to yeah, we want our team us. to grow and prosper as well. Yeah. You know? yeah. so not just us and their, no. their, we're, we want our people to be with us. Yeah. But to, if we're doing the best by them and by everybody, we look to people that have uh, walked the walk mm-hmm. previously to us, that give us, we are, you asked earlier on, Deborah, about uh, you know, how we found ourselves in the roles that we currently do. We have completely different skill sets, natural skill set so it's having the right club for the right shot you know the right person in the right department that, that we understand their strengths and weaknesses and we use their strengths mm-hmm. and it's what can get us there we don't worry so much about the weaknesses provided they can learn and are, are able to give it a go what's the what strengths can the evidence that they bring to us and we like it that people have made mistakes a lot of people try and hide you know when they're coming they don't want to, they're only talking about their successes we talk about our failures because that's where the lessons are. If someone hasn't failed, well, that's a concern to us. That's a red flag, possibly, because they're going to fail at some point. So that means they're going to fail. Good chance they're going to fail on our watch. You know, so we prefer them to have failures and lessons and. And, learning, sure. and I think I think failures, uh, they give us tenacity. They give us the ability to actually kind of pick ourselves up, dust ourselves off and get on with it. I think you've never failed. I can't imagine what it would be like, to be honest, because I can't, I've never been there. But if you've never failed, how will you deal with that first failure? You imagine being in your 50s and never having failed at anything. The first time you fail could be, it could be the end of you. Yeah. Yeah. If you don't fail, you can't evolve. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Completely you're agree. Not, you're not going to grow. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, I think on the failure side, it's so important that mm. because it builds, you can't second guess yourself, you know, and that's dangerous because you do not know how you're going to react or be or cope when you're in that moment, in that position, when, you know, everything's going against you and you don't know how re- it builds character and resilience. Mm. And that can't be taught in a book or at a seminar. You have to experience you know, that physiological, you know, oh no. <laughs> we've, we've actually made decisions off, you know, you, you, you're, you're, you're in the, the heat of the moment, the pressure's on. How are your team acting at that point? Yeah. How are your team going? You know, and that, that's, you know, when you make decisions, do they, do they continue in the journey with you or do you cut? Yeah. Um, you know, how did that act under real pressure? Mm. So tell me a little bit about working together as husband and wife, because, you know, um, I work with a lot of family businesses. They're often husbands and wives, brothers, sisters, all working in the thing. And, of course, you've got, your, you've got your family life and then you've got your business life. How do you keep that working? And what are the biggest challenges you face? Okay, well, I always say we never go to bed in an argument. Nice. 
So we're usually up for three days, four days until it's resolved. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, we, 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 as Graham says, we've got our own strengths and weaknesses and, and our own our own roles. And I always say to Graham, you know, stay in your lane, and he'll say, you know, get out my lane. So, you know, so we know what we're good at. Um, we're very good at supporting each other, you know, so I'm not nagging at Graham, why are you on the phone? Why are you always, you know, always on your computer? You know, if he's got something to do, I'll make sure the kids are okay and he does what he has to do and vice versa, you know. So if I've got something that's really important that I need to deal with, then Graham picks up. So we, we pick up the slack for each other. So mm. it works. We, we hold each other accountable, you know. So if Graham, if we set goals and we're not doing them, we kick each other's bums. Um, and also if we, if we have wins, we, we support each other and we celebrate. So it, it works really well. Yeah. I think for us um, also, I think we when we met, we were working together. Sure. So we've only ever known working together. We've never known anything else. Mm -hmm. So a lot of you know, my friends and that, you know, they, can see, they can never work with their spouse mm -hmm. or their partner or or anything, they're completely at different, uh, you know, mentally, they're in different places. We've only ever known working together. And we consciously took the, the, the decision that when we embarked on a financial education journey, that we'd done it together. Now, it may, that may or may not slow us down. Because it might, we might have been quicker, one of us going off and doing it. But, you know, we only have one life. You know, we don't have this family, uh, private life and business life. We have our life, yep. which incorporates our kids, our family and our business. And we just, we, we don't know anything else, to be honest. <laughs> but it sounds like you have got some quite clearly defined roles and you're really clear about the accountabilities and holding each other accountable, which I think is really key to keeping these things, yeah, some boundaries where you go, this is actually uh, what we're going to work within. And I love the idea of not going to bed, um, you know, without sorting things out, even if it does take a number of days. But yeah. <laughs> so what's been the biggest challenge, do you think, in, in the business? Because obviously you've taken it, say, from one property to now being a global organisation, employing lots of people and um, very profitable what's been the biggest challenge on that journey we've talked about letting people go sometimes what else has happened i think it's blocking out the noise and the advice from you know people that aren't qualified to give you the advice yep. you know that that's a for anyone starting out in business it's quite hard to be careful who you're taking your advice from you know um, as game says we love our families and our dads were very my parents were very successful in their own right but they didn't run their own business. So they weren't qualified to give us advice and running our own business. Yep. Um, and even, you know, our friends, you know, different colleagues, you know, so I think one part of a bit of advice I would say is, you know, be careful who you take advice from. Yep. Are they qualified to give you that advice? Yeah, I think it's a very, very, very good point. A lot of people, um, you know, will tell you what you should do what you ought to do um but unless they've actually been there and walked in those shoes you know do, can they actually give you that advice have they got that experience and, and a lot of them are doing it you know because they look they want to look after you they want to protect you but yeah. you know they're, they're not probably doing it in a malicious way but... yeah, fair enough graham what do you think yeah well like i mean learn hit the nail on the head there there isn't one we've had many challenges and obstacles and um, uh, to overcome over the years. But the constant challenge that has been there from the beginning and will always be there, as Leanne says, is blocking out the noise. Mm. Whether And that's not just from family, friends, that's the media, yep. social, social media, media, all this stuff, where everybody's trying to get you on a side. Mm. They want to get you on their side. So you're going, you know, it's on that side, you've got to be on that side, or you've got to be on that side. There are just certain things that just are. And if you can block out the noise, things just are. You know, and trying to spreadsheet it or work it out and take years to try and decipher it. A lot of people want to win the argument, but don't, but don't want to win. So if you can block out the noise on on winning arguments, that's a distraction. It's keeping this noise and distraction away. 
and keeping your eye on the prize mm -hmm. and the laser beam focus on what it is that you're looking to achieve. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And every day is a constant battle and challenge because we are surrounded by it on somebody's advice or opinion or, or facts, as they want to call it. You know, and that's, that is the, that for me is the constant daily battle when you're running and you're, you're trying to steer your ship. Mm -hmm. It is trying to work out who's just, because most, a lot of people, now my, my family, and, and I, I talked about my dad, my dad intellectually, for, for, for example, he could win any argument intellectually, but he didn't win, really win in life. Mm -hmm. because he was so and I just see so many people like that I said look I'd much rather just you know win it just is like get get you know take action you know block out this noise this noise and distraction that are put in front of us every day and I think it's by design by the way but to, to keep people you know I'm 50 at the end of this month and and well you know crikey we've wasted so much time on rubbish arguments when we could have done so much more in taking action and I just wish a lot more people would uh would would win rather than just yeah. look to win arguments. Mm -hmm. I think I, I can agree with that. I said the other day we, we've had some fantastic highs and some fantastic lows. And I think what Graham's saying there, when we get involved in noise and arguments and fighting back, it costs us more time. Much time. Yep. You know, a time when we should have been focused on doing something better. Yeah. Um, so it's yeah. just it's just being able to, you know, <clears throat> another bit of advice. We always say don't respond. You know, if something's really annoyed you, like an email or a phone call, don't respond right away. Go yep. to sleep, sleep on it, and then respond. Mm -hmm. Mm. Or if you really must, I sometimes say just type out whatever you want to say, but leave it there and then review it in the morning because it's you read it in the morning and it's like, oh my goodness, did I really write that? Okay, so please, I didn't hit send. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, and so I'm really keen to understand because, I mean, a lot of the work that I do with companies around, is around making sure they do have that kind of laser sharp focus. Don't get distracted by the things and, and, you know, working kind of 90 day sprints to make sure you've got that that real clarity of what you're doing. Um you do have to ignore the noise. I think you also sometimes have to go that 80% is good enough and we can just, as long as we're consistently yeah. moving forward, then we're actually heading in the right direction. How do you keep yourself that focus? What do you do in the business to keep that focus? Well, I mean, it's a daily challenge. It's natural now. We do it. You know, we've got a family, friends, people, you know, and everybody's, I think over the years, we've just, and again, through experience, we've become we become, a bit, we get better every year that goes by, a, a, a more resistant to the noise. A, we haven't, we haven't accomplished it because it's still there, and we're, we're, you know, we self sabotage, and we're, you know, we, we, we create our own issues by, you know, to, you know, reacting to something that we shouldn't, or, or have, you know, being asked a question, an opinion, and so it's just, it's stealing your time, it's stealing your focus and your energy. Away from what your, uh, you know, what what the what the goal and objective really is, and I think, you know, again, choosing your team wisely, your advisors wisely, also. So it's been a it's it's a build up of resistance that will always be there. But I think the challenge is all, all, also going to uh, always be there. I don't I don't know how we um, how we we you can eradicate that really, you know. But we've just become better at it. Mm. Um, uh, over the years and an actual fact I think it gives you a, a real advantage you know not wanting to get dragged into you know no, arguments that don't get you anywhere yep. you know they're not you know productive where is that yeah where is that going where how is that taking me closer to my goal I might be right and I probably am <laughs> but I'm not going to spend a year of my life arguing with someone or, or, or people to be right I've just stole a year of my time I've got responsibility to my business our staff our customers that we're going to keep our shareholders our stakeholders to keep going so I you know you've just got to um some of you practice sort yeah. of that. 
I think, I mean, we've got, we've got much better at it, you know, like ignoring the noise, etc. But our close friends and family that are around us quite a lot, I think they've actually got better at, you know, you would go on holiday and Graham and I would work from the morning to lunchtime and you'd have people, why are you not coming to the pool? Why are you not coming to the beach? And you're saying, well, we're busy. We've got things on, we've got calls. Now they don't ask. Yeah. They just let us do our own thing, you know? So, but at the start, it was really hard. Oh, why, why are you not... Why are you not coming out for a meal tonight? Or why? You know, because we're busy, we've, we're focused, we've got things we want to do. So now they just, they mm. leave us to, you know, to our own devices. And mm. when we want to attend the beach and meals and things, we attend. So the, mm. the pressure's less mm. um, from, mm. would you agree? Yeah, I mean, that's like a close, uh, close, close people, but the noise is oh, coming from in from everywhere. everywhere. Yeah. 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 I stopped watching the news, gosh, it must be 10, 15 years ago now because I just realised that I can't affect it. I can't do anything about it. And most of it's not particularly positive, let's face it. So what is the point of subjecting yourself to that? And and I've seen people, I think I've seen it with, with legal stuff where they've literally, you know, fought against divorces, against being right in a particular situation for such a long time. You kind of go, if you hadn't taken that 18 months of legal action and all that brain space and all that negativity what could you have created on the positive side rather than fighting for the loss? Like, let it go. Um, pay that person whatever they want just to get them out of your life so that you can actually move on and, and, and focus on the things that will add value rather than take away. Yeah. Yeah, we've done that. And uh, I think we've learned that again over the years. You know, we are, we, we are, uh, we stand up for ourselves. We stand up for our businesses. We protect them. If we, you know, I, I have people, up, um, but we are, also look at it commercially mm. as well now and make sure that, uh, look, we pick our battles yes. is what I'm, uh, you know. And that uh, comes from experience. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, because it's, it's an opportunity time. cost. It's an opportunity cost of wasting that time, that energy that yes. you could be focusing on yeah. other things. It's the same as, I mean, it's a little bit different in property potentially, but I mean, I know when you're working uh, with clients in the B2B space, you know, there are some clients that you just know they're not your perfect client. They're not the person you really want to work with, but you kind of go, oh, well, they're paying me. But then you sort of think, well, if they're taking up that amount of space, I don't have any space yeah, okay. for somebody else to come in and, and take it so yeah. you have to let go and say no so that you can open up to bigger better opportunities you're spot on there by the way i mean every time uh you, you need to leave the space open mm -hmm. and something will always come in the space yeah. you just got to believe in that yeah it just does you know you spreadsheet it you say where's the next client coming from where's the next deal coming from where's the next opportunity you know you're you can spreadsheet that to death Sorry, I just want to go back to your point on 80%. Mm. Absolutely correct. The, the traffic lights are not, all, they are not always going to be at green when you leave your house to go on your journey. There is never the perfect moment. For us, the, you know, we don't spreadsheet it to death. 80, 90% is good enough. That will take that. Move on. Yep. And we'd rather get 90% done than wait 10 years for it to be 100%. Mm. Okay, because we've evolved. And again, that's you know, perfect. We don't get hung up on. We've misspelt an email. We've got a mistake on our website or something. Come on, come Who on. Cares? You know, yeah. Let's go. yeah, come on. It's but so people, sure. but some people really make it. That you know, they get so obsessed by being perfect. We don't. We don't wait on that. We get. You know, we we want it to be as good as we can. But there's a cost to perfection, mm. time cost, financial cost. We just, you know, we are, we are content with very good. Yep not perfect. We are content with that to continue to move on at pace. And, and I think you're absolutely right. I mean, sometimes we don't know the how or what is going to happen, but it just does. Uh, and it, But it can't happen yeah. if you don't have the space. So if you haven't got the space yeah. to allow things in, then it actually just physically can't happen. So just sometimes let go, trust. Um, if you're doing the right things, you know, you're putting one thing in front of the other, it will come as it's intended, yeah. Well, there's been a lot of learnings in there. So I mean, some things around, you know, obviously letting people go if they're not the right people. There is, you know, not not wanting to be perfect, shutting out the noise. If you had to give kind of three top tips or tools based on your experiences to date, what would they be, do you think? Well, my number one is fail faster. Mm. Fail faster. Get in the game yep. as quickly as you can. I started when I was young. I had failures. 
I should have started well before that. And I should have done bigger deals than what I'd done. So fail faster and don't be afraid. You know, the advice normally is take baby steps, find your way, you know, touch it fairly. You know, that advice then, that's coming from people that are only ever taking baby steps. At some point, you've got to take a bigger step and a bigger step and a bigger step. But absolutely for me, it's fail faster. Yeah, and I think you're right. I mean, if you look at some of my my heroes, for example, um, they took massive steps and they had some massive failures as well. But they picked themselves yeah. up, they learned from it, they moved forward, they they got better and better and better. And I think, you know, most millionaires, billionaires, probably whatever you need to be these days, have had a, at least two or three failures before they really nailed it, which I think is important. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so fail faster, take bigger steps. What else? Have a good team around you and yeah. advisors, you know. <clears throat> Again, are they qualified to advise you? Are they qualified to be in your team? And if they're not, cut quick, you know, because we, we have learned, you know, as Graham said, we were, we were loyal to the person, but not to the company and the, the outcome. Um, so, you know, it's part of business, it's part of life. Yep. Um, and But the team yeah. around you, you know. Yeah, and it is a team. So, you know, that one person, you might be trying to look after that one person, but you've probably got 99 other people who are really upset by the fact that you've kept that incompetent, whatever it might be, person on yeah. board. So what's the better outcome? Yeah. Yeah. Third and final thing. Well, I, I, for me, is play to win. Yeah. You know, we see a lot of people getting to maybe they have, you know, a relative amount of success, small success, or, you know, if they came through, then they freeze and they play not to lose what they've got. That's dangerous. Yep. You know, we play to win. Now, that's risky, but the, the, the rewards are, are, are significant. Remember what started you in the first place. You know, it, you know why you're doing what you're doing, but we've just seen it over so many and the people then, they get terrified, they got a certain amount of success, they stop playing to win, start playing to protect or secure or not to lose, mm. and lo and behold, they're gone within two or three years. Remember, you're playing to win. Love it. Great. Hey, so if somebody wants to get in contact with you, wants to do business with you, um, how would they do that? Well, our website address, thecarlinggroup.co.uk, um, or on LinkedIn, both on LinkedIn, Graham dot Carling and excuse me, Ian dot Carling on LinkedIn. Beautiful. And what kind of people do you like to work with? Um, ambitious, um, energetic, yeah, passionate. Uh, somebody that's got yeah. real drive that they're hungry. Yeah. 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 Excellent. Hey, look, it's been a real pleasure talking to you. I all, almost understood every word too, which is always great when you're speaking with Scottish people. <laughs> but no, seriously, it has. It's been a lot of fun. Really enjoyed it. Some really, really good tips there. Don't forget, it's the carlinggroup.co.uk. Leanne and Graham Carling, both on LinkedIn. Um, thank you. I mean, I, I can see that you make a wonderful partnership both in business and in, in life. So um, well done on all that you've done. And I look forward to seeing you go even higher and winning even more. Thank you very Thank much. You. Thank Thanks. you for having us. Oh, absolute pleasure. Thank you.